Welcome back. This will be part two of chapter 18, commercialization of sex. Now, several of you asked questions either on perusal or in your discussion posts about uh, sex work and prostitution as sex work. There's been a growing conversation um, globally about um, sex workers and, and specifically uh, prostitution uh, and the way it's going to be treated as work that is protected by other um, by laws that that protect other workers in other industries. It's controversial, um, as many of you noted in your comments and questions to each other, um, because you know there are there are moral and ethical issues. There are issues about um, exposure of children to to prostitution and so on. So there there are a number of both pros and cons to to uh, regulating and making legal um, prostitution as work. Um, first, let's get some definitions out of the way. Prostitution, as you you probably understand, is providing sexual behaviors of various kinds in exchange for money. Um, or other tangible goods. Uh, uh, one possibility is drugs, others is housing or food, um, depending on where we're talking about the, the exchange of some kind of um, either monetary or other support would vary uh, based on the culture. Sex work um, is a, a way of, of reconceptualizing prostitution um, and other forms of sex work where people are legitimately earning a living uh, by providing various sexual services. And, and that includes a broad range of types of work, um, acting in pornographic film, um, working as a dancer or stripper, uh, being a phone sex or camp, webcam sex worker, um, and among other types of occupations. And again, using the concept of sex work suggests that this is work, much like any other form of work, that has pros and cons and risks um, and benefits. Um, the argument by those who advocate for the use of the term sex work uh, is that it would, it would normalize, regularize, and make legitimate the work, um, much the way other forms of work are defined. Now, um, we have to talk about, you know, a, a relatively speaking, relatively recent phenomenon, um, which is this this concept of sugar babies. It's not that they've never existed before, but in recent years there has been the emergence of um, a, an aggressively marketed form of sugar baby lifestyle. That and the the aggressive marketing has been directed almost exclusively toward college women. Um, suggesting that in their marketing ploys, and if you Google Sugar Baby University, you can find, you can see what I mean. Um, the the website very aggressively markets to uh, women in college, suggesting that this is a way that you can pay for your college education um, or your graduate education um, by contracting, seeking an arrangement is what it's called, seeking an arrangement with someone who's wealthy enough to um, basically buy your time. Now on the website and, and others like it for Sugar Baby University or Seeking Arrangement, it's, it's very carefully worded to not suggest that sexual services are required. Um, and in fact, it's assumed that the people posting their profiles there, you know, college women, um, are going to to have control over what they will contractually agree to and what they will not um, in terms of their services. Um, the the way the the website is is constructed, it it suggests that what you're providing is companionship. What you're providing is, you know, your youth, your engaging personality, your beauty um, as a companion for a person who can afford to do so. Um, in some cases, what what women are are paid is um, in in 
direct terms their education. So paying for tuition, paying for room and board, paying for other um, requirements. In other cases, it's it's more diffuse. Um, uh, what people are being paid, maybe their rent or their wardrobe or other kinds of, of services. Now, what we know, I mean, research on the sugar baby experience is not, um, there isn't a great deal of it, um, but we know that there's, there's a real, rather astounding number of young women in colleges and universities across the country who post their profiles on seeking arrangement and um, have their services purchased by wealthy people in their areas. Um, most of the people purchasing services are men. Um, they tend to be middle age or older um, and they um, almost exclusively are seeking young women. Um, there are women who post seeking arrangements with men. Um, there are some um, services where you have seeking arrangements for um, that are homosexual in nature, uh, but those are by far less common than older men who are seeking arrangements with young women. Um, typically, the, the women who are posting profiles are young, they're uh, attractive, they're educated, they are articulate, um, and their goal is to seek a source of, of income. Um, since the organization is really aggressively marketing to college student women, um, most of the women in what little research there is have reported that they're trying to pay for their college education um, and, um, among other expenses, living expenses. Sugar daddies are, are described as, um, in again, what little research we have as wealthy men um, not necessarily older, the, the predominant um, characteristics are, you know, men in their, their middle age to um, closer to retirement age uh, who are providing uh, ostensibly, you know, this is the way the, the marketing is, is structured, men who want to provide mentoring and money um, to, to younger women. Now, the, again, the, in order to avoid charges of prostitution, these uh, websites have to very carefully word what they're presenting publicly. Um, and they, they don't make explicit that what sugar daddies are seeking is um, paying money for sex because that would be in violation of the law. Um, so what they talk about is mentoring and friendship and companionship and so on. But what um, again, the research is limited, but what, what the, the women who've been surveyed say is most of the time there's an expectation of sexual interaction um, at some point in exchange for, um, for money. So by most legal standards, you're talking about prostitution here. Um, but you know, still some of the women who, who report doing this kind of work, and, and I've been told by my students in the past that there have been students at Mountain Union who have um, gone through seeking arrangements and have been set up with uh, men in, in the Northeast Ohio area who want companionship and they provide um, funding uh, for them for their education or for other things like um, uh, expensive meals or um, outings, vacations, uh, and clothing, and so on. And, and some women report that there is not an explicit, explicit expectation of sex, um, but rather they have, you know, very clearly defined that sex is not something that they will be providing, that they will provide companionship and um, a, a variety of very clearly articulated uh, services, but explicitly excluding sex. Um, more research is required to find out, you know, just how common is the expectation of sexual services in exchange for money um, with this particular industry. You know, law enforcement has been, you know, attempting to investigate the, the whole Sugar Baby University thing. And I did post a um, documentary that you can watch on D2L um, looking into the, the Seeking Arrangements website, 
uh, very early on in its history. You would have to do some more research on your own in order to see where the status of that, that those investigations is at the current time. Now, the, the process of becoming a prostitute is variable. Um, researchers have come at this from a number of different angles, some from sociological perspectives, some from a psychological perspective. Um, we could do an entire course on just the culture of prostitution in various um, uh, countries and across time if we wanted to. But looking at it very simply, there are certain characteristics that tend to be correlated um, if we look at the backgrounds of women who, who work at, as prostitutes. And the research that's presented in your text is largely from the United States and from Western Europe. What's been found in, in research, and, and here we're, we're looking at prostitution broadly, so various levels of prostitution all the way from from streetwalkers to uh, high value um, call girls, um, what what women report, and, and most of this research has been on women, the overwhelming majority has been on women. Um, they tend to report having early first sexual experiences. There is a correlation with early physical and sexual abuse. There is a history typically of estrangement from parents and sometimes that departure, that estrangement happens relatively early. So in, in mid to late adolescence in some cases. And there's a tendency for women who work as prostitutes to be poor. Reasons that women report, and these are, these are often questionnaire studies or interview studies, women report that they, they engage in prostitution to provide an income for themselves and sometimes for their children. Um, they also talk about having been influenced by peers, and that includes friends and uh, people in their schools who uh, tend to share a, uh, a set of normative expectations that sex is linked with money or that it's a way to, to earn money. Um, it may even be presented, you know, depending on the, the culture where someone lives, it may be presented as one of your only options for making money um, as a young woman. Um, some uh, people report that they were um, tricked or coerced into uh, being a prostitute. Um, and and this, this is kind of linked in with, with becoming um, a sex trafficked person. So sometimes people are told, you know, I will give you this money for to, to immigrate to another country. And then when they arrive, they are forced to work off the debt um, that was that they didn't even know they owed. Um, so for example, a family may pay um, a broker to help their, their daughter uh, emigrate to another country to work. And when they arrive, they are met and told that the price is now much higher and they have to work as a prostitute in order to pay off that, that debt. Um, in some cases, there are, are people who will kind of seek out um, young women who are, you know, look at that first set of bullet points. They're estranged, they may be runaways, they may be poor, um, and therefore at risk. And in some cases, uh, people will seek them out and kind of groom them um, to become prostitutes. So, you know, for example, a man may kind of target young girls who are runaways um, and then befriend them, provide them food, provide them housing, and then trick them out um, as prostitutes. Um, for many uh, who, who describe their work as prostitutes, they, they talk about the choice as having some clear pros and cons. In some cases, women who work as prostitutes, and I'm, I'm specifically referring to women because that's what we have the most research on. Um, it's not that there aren't men who, who work in prostitution, there certainly are. Um, but uh, what women tend to report is 
that they like is that it provides them with some independence and freedom, the flexibility to work when they want, and the ability to, to manage their lives, especially if they are um, uh, mothers, if they are caring for children. Now, you know, obviously I say that, and for some of you, you may cringe at the idea that someone would choose prostitution as a profession because it enables them to provide for their children. Um, keep in mind that for, for many women who are poor, who are living in depressed areas, they may have very, very few options. If they are parents, uh, particularly if they are single parents, they may have very few options for work, for paid work that actually enables them to be there for their children when they need to be. So before you, you kind of um, respond to your cringe, uh, think about it in broader terms. Now, the international data, and I found this from a study conducted by Farley, um, to, just to drill down into um, the, what we know about women who work as prostitutes internationally, because the previous information that I just presented was largely U.S. data. So what about the international findings? Depending on country, and that's why this percentage is such a wide range, um, anywhere from 65 to 95 percent um, of women who work as prostitutes uh, reported a history of, of having been sexually assaulted when they were children. Um, the variation, you know, 65 to 95, that's a pretty broad range. Um, it really depends on the cultural context. In some cultures, for example, having been raped means that you now are no longer marriageable. You now have, uh, are considered to be um, outcast. So women under those circumstances may be forced, essentially, in order to feed themselves to work as prostitutes in that kind of cultural context. 70 to 95 percent report that while they were working as prostitutes, they were sex, they were phys physically assaulted, that they'd been um, hit or um, otherwise injured as a result of their work. So what that tells you is that internationally, this is a high risk occupation. It's a very physical occupation, obviously, but it also comes with the risk of being physically assaulted um, while, while you're at it. So um, you also have to couple that with the fact that 60 to 80 percent, depending on the culture, report that they were raped, meaning that they said no, that they denied a potential client what they wanted and they were forced to engage in, in sex anyway. Um, now, again, you know, a, a thought bubble may be popping out of your head saying, wait, they're prostitutes. How can they be raped? Well, you need to think very clearly that um, even though a person is engaging in sex work, they have the, the ability and the right to say what is and is not okay for them to do. For example, a prostitute may be completely unwilling to um, provide anal sex to a partner um, who purchases their time. They may be unwilling to engage in unsafe sex. And if they say no, and the person that they has hired them forces them, that is by definition rape. Now, if that's going to be prosecuted really depends on the jurisdiction and the attitudes of the, the prosecutors and police that are involved. Um, in international data, about three quarters of, of people working in prostitution report that they have at some point been homeless, which kind of underscores the fact that these are economically vulnerable people who typically work in this industry. 85 to 95 percent of those in, in prostitution, um, regardless of culture, tend to report wishing that they could get out of it. Um, for many um, women in this research, they report that um, you know, they understand that working in prostitution is a short-term occupation. It, it, you, it's a job of the young. It's a job of the resilient. Um, and it's typically not the desired occupation that people want. It's a, an occupation of necessity. So 
kind of forget the pop culture movie versions of prostitution, um, things like Pretty Woman in the 1980s, uh, where you have a, a high value call girl who's very successful and wealthy and very good at her job, um, who is then saved by Prince Charming, who wants to take her out of the life. Um, <clears throat> The reality is far more likely that individuals working in prostitution are very poor, very marginalized, and very at risk. They often are physically and sexually assaulted as a part of their, their work. Um, Farley also reports that, that just under 70% um, of the people investigated in this study um, had worked in in various locations like strip clubs, massage parlors, and in, in street prostitution. 68% um, of those people that were working in that part of the those various aspects of the industry um, tested positive on a screener for post-traumatic stress. Now this shouldn't be surprising given the percentages that I just described about physical assaults and sexual assaults that occur as a part of the work and also the fact that you have um, individuals uh, in working in this industry who tend to have been sexually assaulted as children. Um, the vast majority, 95% in this particular study, reported that they, they encounter sexual ha harassment uh, of a form that it would be illegal if they were working any other job. Now again, people often go, you're working as a prostitute, you're selling sex for money, of course people are going to say things that are demeaning and disgusting to you. Um, so culturally we tend to believe that that's a part of the package and if you choose to be a prostitute you should be expect to be treated badly. Um, now people in the, the sex worker movement argue that's that's wrong-headed, that just because you're a sex worker doesn't mean that you should endure sexual harassment. Finally, um, depending on the cultural context, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of those in who work in prostitution regularly experience verbal abuse um, and also face the fact that they work in a stigmatized industry and that that adversely affects them. So what happens um, in many cases is that women have to kind of live a double life. They, they may in their um, part of their lives, you know, try to hide the fact of what they do uh, because it is stigmatizing. Um, if they are parents, they may have to try and present a, a, a self that doesn't um, work as a sex worker so that other people will not um, treat their children badly or exclude their children from educational and other social opportunities. Um, Sergetti um, reported that there, there are a number of different types of clients. Um, and you know studying people who, who work who hire prostitutes is very difficult. Um, it's it's hard to access these individuals. It's not like you can go, you know, put out a friendly survey monkey request to your Facebook friends and say, hey, have you um, sought the services of a prostitution of a prostitute and expect them to respond. Um, so even though it's difficult, Sarah Getty was able to kind of define some some categories of people. For some people, they they seek out prostitutes not on a continuous basis, but um, to explore because they are they want to experiment, they're curious, they, they may, may have fantasies about prostitutes and what they do and what they can offer. Um, some men will, uh, that the Sarah Getty describes as yo-yoers, they, they stop seeing sex, sex workers when they're in a relationship, but they go back to sex workers when their relationships are no longer satisfying or that those relationships have ended. These tend to be men who skew a bit younger, um, so men in their 30s. There are those in Sir Goody's study who um, were described as being compulsive, that they found it difficult to avoid 
um, seeking out prostitutes and having sex with them. They may be in relationships, they may have marriages or, or long-term partnerships, um, but they, they feel compelled um, in a fairly obsessive way to seek out prostitutes and purchase their services. <clears throat> um, Sarah Getty also describes uh, bookends, and these are, are people whose early sexual experiences were with sex workers, and then later um, they, they may go back um, you know, they may have relationships, marriages, long-term uh, commitments, but they may go back later in their lives. Maybe those relationships ended. Uh, maybe they are bored or dissatisfied with their current sexual relationships. So they go back to prostitutes to um, fulfill their, their sexual desires or needs. Um, and then finally, there are people who, who are described as pretty much their their only sexual relationships are with uh, with prostitutes. So throughout their lifetime, they have used the services of prostitutes um, on a fairly regular basis. <clears throat> now, many have argued, and there are some countries where um, prostitution has been decriminalized. Since prostitution is a very controversial topic, um, some individuals see it as uh, purely sexual abuse and exploitation. Others see it as, as work. It, it's a legitimate way that people can earn a living. Um, it meets a need. There are people who want to purchase this, and therefore they provide that. <clears throat> the argument essentially is that, you know, you're talking about consenting adults. You have an adult who is choosing to say, I will have sex with you if you pay me, um, and setting up the terms of that, that interaction. Others argue that it is immoral to pay for sex, that the people who engage in prostitution are very frequently not doing so voluntarily, and they're doing so out of desperation, or they're being forced. So proponents of the the first view of prostitution as abuse or or exploitation suggests that you know determining whether or not a person is actually consenting if they are this you know consenting adult engaging in a business arrangement it's difficult to to really figure out how voluntary is this work um, because you have so many people who are on the fringes, who are economically fragile, who are poor, um, who are marginalized, uh, who ha may have had problematic early experiences that leave their ability to consent um, challenged. If you're talking about people with mental health problems such as PTSD from their early experiences, you can raise legitimate questions about um, consent. When you add the intersecting issues of gender and race and economics, if you add in LGBTQ issues, um, you, you, you complicate this issue of consent and the, the risk of exploitation and abuse. Um, those issues become stronger. Um, others contend that while you do have exploitation occurring, and even while it happens fairly often um, in terms of physical exploitation, economic exploitation, and, and otherwise, the people have a right, if they choose to, to be sex workers. So for, for many on this side of the argument, what they say is, if we acknowledge that people have a right to engage in work as sex workers, we have a responsibility to regulate the work. So in, there's an acknowledgement that exploitation happens. So if we say people have a right to be sex workers, we should regulate it such that that exploitation does not happen. So guaranteeing people um, wages, guaranteeing them health protections, guaranteeing them benefits, and so on. Guaranteeing them safe ways of, uh, say, accepting credit cards or other kinds of banking that are currently kind of outside of the boundaries for, for sex workers to use. Um, so 
you know, you have these two sides of the argument. On the one side, uh, you have uh, people who are really highlighting and underscoring the idea that this is exploitative work and it should be uh, remain illegal. On the other hand, there are people who argue it's work, it should be regulated such that people won't be exploited while they're doing it. Both camps think that there should be legal protections uh, for people. Now, in this part of your chapter, they are still talking mostly about women. Um, uh, we should expand that. Um, many of the people who are working in the sex industry, um, both voluntarily and not, are men, are trans, are LGBTQIA. So uh, I would prefer that your authors, you know, not just exclusively look at this in terms of women, um, but in terms of human beings. So both camps do believe that, that legal protections are required. Um, however, they differ in terms of what kinds of legal protections are, are needed. There is a global tend, trend rather um, in the direction of putting less emphasis on um, legally pursuing the people who are working as prostitutes or as sex workers in other in other forms and instead going after um, the clients. So there's globally there's been a tendency to try and reduce prostitution by criminalizing the purchasers by arresting them, charging them fines, giving them jail time and so on. That varies culture to culture, but globally, there's a tendency moving in that direction. Um, the so-called Nordic model, um, in, which is, you know, in parts of Scandinavia, um, you see policies where you're, you're very vigorously um, decriminalizing sex work and regulating it intense, intentionally. And what's been found in those those cultures is a reduce in trafficking and a reduce in physical assaults and sexual assaults for the individuals involved. Not that they've disappeared, that those problems have disappeared, but they have been reduced. Now, among the arguments for legalization is that you know there's there's an economic uh, motive here. If you can tax people. Um, sex workers can then contribute to the economy. So the argument is that if you have all of the people working in the sex industry, in pornography, in strip clubs, in prostitution, in camming, um, et cetera, that's a lot of untaxed dollars that could be fed back into the economy. Um, specifically here, your author's talking about prostitution. Uh, but the entire sex industry could be regulated in that way. Um, it, this could help to regulate the criminal activities that tend to surround prostitution, such as uh, uh, trafficking in drugs um, and uh, sex trafficking more broadly. It could help reduce teenage prostitution. So if there were, uh, you know, aggressive statutes that that dictated exactly under what circumstances can you be a professional sex worker. Um, age limits could be set um, with certain requirements for entry into the, the work itself. There could be protections um, that help sex workers, uh, particularly prostitutes, to be able to report when they've been assaulted um, to report when they have been victimized, to report when they are being stalked without concern that they're going to be arrested or fined um, and otherwise, you know, engaged by the police. There could also be public health regulations that are added, um, such as requiring the use of condoms or requiring regular health exams. Um, certainly in the, in the pornography industry, at least in the, the, the legal and um, regulated pornography industry, there have been um, efforts among uh, people working in the industry to make it healthier, to require that act actors have SDI testing and um, that they supply those health records on a regular basis. 
that's certainly not top to bottom in that industry, but it's one example of how that can work. Now we're going to move on to talking about sex trafficking. And here I'm, I'm moving away from reliance on your text to bringing in some outside information as I do kind of regularly in this class. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services has uh, for probably the last 15 years or so been steadily building up its um, information and data collection on sex trafficking. Um, and it's a problem in the United States. I'm sure that as students, you've heard about these issues. Um, I know that some of my colleagues teaching other classes uh, talk about these issues frequently. Um, but you know, despite the fact that you may have heard about sex trafficking, my guess is that you know relatively little about it and how common it might be. Now, according to the US Department of Health and Human Services, they talk about sex trafficking as modern day slavery. Um, and here, what's, what happens, and sex trafficking happens all around the globe. It, in some places, it's a, a, a very um, organized, it's an organized crime activity. In other cases, it's more informal. But basically, what you have is um, commercialized sex acts that are, are forced. So people are induced into it, they're brought into it through force, through fraud, through coercion. Um, and uh, certainly if, if the person is under the age of 18, um, you can see how that would be you know, even more problematic. Um, in, in, for people over 18, all that's required for it be, to be labeled sex, sex trafficking is for the person to be forced, defrauded, or coerced. If the person's under 18, you don't have to prove those those three things, force, fraud, or coercion. If they're a child and they're, they're being uh, employed for prostitution or other sexual acts, that's sex trafficking. Um, the, the stories about sex trafficking are, are harrowing and horrendous. Um, one example of, of a common route to being sex trafficked is say a person or a family wants to get their daughter out of their country because they have no prospects or they they can't find a job um, they, they want to move say from eastern europe to uh, western europe or the united states or they want to move from parts of asia to western europe to the united states they may um, pay a bribe or pay a broker or someone else who's on the shady side of the law they'll arrive at their destination and basically be met by someone who tells them you now are our property and you must do this um, or you'll be sent back or you'll be turned into authorities or whatever um, so sex trafficking sometimes happens in that way in in other cases you have people literally being plucked off the street and forced into sex work now, in the United States, the, the Trafficking Victim, Victims Protection Act was passed in 2000, um, and it made um, intentional sex trafficking a federal violation. Um, there are you know, various legal concepts here in the TVPA. You have Commercial Sex Act defined as um, anything of value being given uh, or received by a person for performing a sex act. So it could be money, it could be drugs, it could be uh, any variety of things. Um, in general, the trafficked individual is not directly benefiting. The person who is trafficking them is who is benefiting from those, those payments uh, or those objects of value. The TVPA looks at traffickers um, in terms of how they coerce um, people into trafficked relationships. So they acknowledge that traffickers often use psychological coercion as well as physical um, abuse and bondage to, to keep people um, working in sex trafficking. So they threaten people, they physically restrain them, they lock them up, they starve them. Um, they may threaten their families. 
um, or threaten them with legal um, uh, ramifications, such as if the person is undocumented, turning them into the government. Um, they may propose plans or schemes that cause people to believe that um, their families would be harmed, that other people they care about would be harmed, or that they will be they will be murdered um, as a result of of not complying. Um, and they may also um, threaten to use the legal process, as I mentioned before, against them. The victims, um, you know, worldwide, the overwhelming majority tend to be women and girls, but there are uh, boys and men who are sex trafficked as well. Uh, but statistically speaking, we're, the majority of sex trafficking victims are, are girls and women. Um, there are a number of patterns that tend to be common. Um, in some cases, you have the promise of a good job in another country, kind of like the example I was describing earlier. Um, sometimes these are, are faked um, marriage proposals. So like foreign bride uh, companies may be a front where they're, they're offering people an opportunity and have they have fake clients who say that they're, they're going to you know, bring you to a new country and marry you and therefore you become a citizen and so on. But when, when they arrive, what's really happened is that they're um, going to be trafficked. Uh, people can be sold into the sex trade directly by their families, um, by husbands, by boyfriends, or they can be kidnapped, as I said, snatched off the street. And in those cases, most likely what you're looking at is, is people who were already vulnerable, people who were economically marginal, people who um, are uh, unconnected to resources or to family and so on, who may be kidnapped. Um, traffickers frequently use debt bondage to keep people tied to them. So, you know, giving them just a, a crazy amount of money that they can never pay off and tell their victims that they owe it. Um, uh, it they often tether it to their living expenses, to their travel expenses, their transport expenses, and so on. And therefore, they, they have to provide these services in order to, to pay off the debt um, and earn their freedom, which they almost never do because sex traffickers don't honor uh, their statements of exactly what needs to be paid. Um, still with the Department of Health and Human Services, um, some research within the department has shown that traffickers use a variety of conditioning techniques that are fairly horrific. Um, many people who have survived sex, sex trafficking report that they were routinely denied food and water. Um, they were routinely confined, um, frequently under very um, dire circumstances. Um, they were routinely beaten um, and otherwise physically abused. Most of them reported having been raped. Um, and this, this is especially you know, disturbing when you're talking about children and teens who are being sex trafficked. They will often be raped by their captors first to kind of condition them and prepare them to be, um, become essentially sex workers who the, can then earn money. Um, frequently, this is reported to involve gang rapes. Um, many of the survivors report that their families were threatened, that they were threatened personally. Um, many are report that they were given drugs, either forcibly or otherwise. Um, and frequently this was reported to be addictive drugs. Um, so opiates and, and other kinds of drugs that were used to kind of keep them, them tethered to their, their trafficker. So if they become addicted to opiates, for example, and their trafficker is the one who supplies them with opiates, they, they need those drugs and they may stay even if they had opportunities to escape, which they usually don't. But even if they did, um, their drug addiction keeps them tied 
Um, in some countries, the threat involves shaming victims, making them making their behaviors public, even though their behaviors were forced. In some cultures, it doesn't matter whether you were trafficked or not. The fact that you were having sex outside of a marital relationship that was arranged by your family is shameful. Um, and therefore, um, that threat has a great deal of power. Now, victims you know, face a number of, of risks and uh, negative outcomes. On the physical side, um, many victims are found to have drug and alcohol addictions as a result of being trafficked. Many have suffered a variety of physical injuries, including traumatic brain injuries from beatings. Um, many report having sexually transmitted diseases, including ones that cannot be cured, such as herpes and HIV. Um, as a result of these uh, physical insults, as well as STI infections, um, sterility, miscarriages, problems with the reproductive with reproductive health are common, um, and also contracting other diseases, especially diseases that can be contracted as a result, such as hepatitis, um, but also just you know being kept held captive in unsanitary conditions in some countries means that you're going to be susceptible to tuberculosis, to malaria, other kinds of health conditions. Um, many victims report that they were forced or coerced into having abortions, even though they didn't want them. On the psychological side, victims um, often face um, dissociated dissociation experiences that are, are connected to post-traumatic stress. Um, so you, what's described here is mind-body separations or, or dissociation. Um, depersonalization is, is something that is a part of the PTSD experience. So that's been reported. Um, shame, grief, and fear, um, psychological reactions against people who remind them of their, their captors, their traffickers, um, can be problematic. And there's a, a fair amount of self-blame and self-hatred that comes along with this. Suicide and suicidality are a, a, a risk, um, certainly for, for victims of sex, sex trafficking, um, because of both their, their tendency to have post-traumatic stress disorder, but also because they've been conditioned to see themselves as worthless objects. So I mentioned already post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, victims also may suffer from what's called traumatic bonding, meaning that um, regardless of age, and you may be thinking that would happen more often with children, but not necessarily. Uh, people who've been trafficked are systematically, psychologically conditioned to depend on and need their trafficker. Their trafficker may very carefully, you know, rescue them from an abusive um, client, may uh, be nice to them occasionally, may provide them with nice, nice things now and then, uh, but it's all contractual. Nevertheless, uh, a victim is in such a, a fragile state, uh, both physically and emotionally, that they may find themselves uh, bonded to their trafficker and find it emotionally difficult to, to separate themselves from their trafficker. There are a variety of types, categories of sex trafficking that have been identified. Um, the, the sexual exploitation can involve and often does involve prostitution. Um, it can be uh, for being forced to be filmed and photographed. Um, it may mean working in sex clubs, uh, engaging in stripping and various activities associated with it. It may involve participating in live sex shows um, the mail order bride industry is kind of uh, filled with uh, possibilities for being trafficked. Um, there's a prostitution that is connected to the militaries of many um, countries. So you're, you're basically being trafficked into areas that are heavily um, occupied by military and therefore, you know, you're, you're there uh, to be provided to soldiers who pay the trafficker for access. 
Um, there's also, you know, a huge industry for sex tourism. There are entire um, industries that have been set up in various countries uh, around the globe where people um, will go to these locations in order to have quick, ready access to, to, to sex that with young women from that population. So sex traffickers will, will often kind of set up shop in those areas. They will coerce and, and recruit um, girls and women to, to provide those services to foreign um, people who will come in and pay large sums of money for um, exploitation. Vic victims who are trafficked into prostitution and pornography um, are usually the ones who are the most likely to be exploited um, and physically and psychologically harmed uh, in these operations. They can be found, um, you know, sex trafficking off occupations sometimes are just hidden in plain sight. They, they may be in highly um, visible places, as would be the case with uh, streetwalkers, but also there are just these really hidden underground um, networks of se sex trafficked individuals. Um, in some cases, you have uh, brothels that are set up in residential areas, even in the suburbs, and uh, people can be seen coming in and out, in and out uh, of these locations. I even, I read a report recently that in some cases, Airbnbs are um, abused by sex traffickers who will kind of move in temporarily, traffic a group of, of girls, and then pack up and move to a different Airbnb in a different location in order to avoid detection. Trafficking, trafficking takes place in a lot of different um, public and private locations, massage parlors, spas, and strip clubs, as you might guess. Um, many people are kind of um, put through a series of stages as they move into trafficked sex work. So they may start with dancing and stripping, um, maybe with an expectation that they're going to move into legitimate, quote unquote, legitimate dancing or acting and then they are coerced further into prostitution and pornography um, where their exploitation continues. Now, if you're looking at the United States, <clears throat> in the United States, um, the National Human Trafficking Hotline, which is associated with the Department of Health and Human Services, they have noted that, um, and I, I want you to, to note for those of you who are Ohioans, um, where we are on this graphic, um, California has the highest number of cases, followed by Texas, Florida, and there we are, Ohio. Um, I know that some of you uh, had mentioned that you know the sex trafficking problem in Ohio is is pretty shocking for a Midwestern state. Uh, but there you have it. There are, are certain ways in which sex trafficking is kind of taken root in some locations in Ohio. As you might guess, the hot spots are in the major cities like Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati. And on this graphic, what you can see with Ohio, as I mentioned, you know, the, the red spots on the map are the major cities in Ohio. Um, and those tend to be where most of the cases of sex trafficking have been um, identified. Now, also on this, this um, graphic, you know, sex trafficking is only one kind of trafficking. Um, there's also labor trafficking, where people who are vulnerable, let's say undocumented immigrants, um, they're kind of trapped into uh, servitude, into uh, indentured servitude or slavery uh, for work. Um, agricultural work, cleaning um, uh, are just a couple of examples of how this, cannot, this can happen. Um, you can see the numbers. Most of the trafficking cases in the state of Ohio are sex trafficking cases. So that 349, that's just what has been come to the attention of law enforcement. You have to kind of multiply that out to find the real number uh, of people who are victimized in this particular way.
As far as, as types of trafficking, and again, this comes from the National Human Trafficking Hotline, um, which is connected to the Department of Health and Human Services, sex trafficking is the, is the most common, um, followed by labor trafficking and other types of trafficking um, that aren't specified. For some people, they are experiencing both sex and labor um, trafficking. Under labor, um, the majority of cases tend to be domestic work. So people who are brought in for um, uh, childcare, house cleaning, other kinds of cleaning work, um, preparing meals and so on. Um, there are also uh, traveling crews. So these can be on, on ships, in trucking, on a variety of other um, traveling industries agriculture, restaurant and food service, uh, and retail. Um, the top venues for uh, industries for sex trafficking um, in the United States are in massage and spa businesses. And that may surprise you. You might be thinking, you know, street walking would be the number one. Um, but the, the highest percentage in uh, the United States are these these pop-ups of massage parlors and spas. Um, and many of the in individuals who are being trafficked are not um, citizens. Um, in some cities, for example, you have massage parlors that are largely um, stocked with young Asian women. Um, in other locations, it's uh, Latina um, girls and women, uh, just depends on the, the, the culture of the particular area in which the work is being done. Um, after uh, massage parlors and spa businesses, you have residence-based commercial sex, hotel and motel-based, um, and that's typically prostitution, uh, and then pornography and escort services, which are a bit more high-end. So to, to finish out our conversation about sex trafficking and to, to close this chapter, I just want to, to underscore the point that the, the majority of people who are trafficked for sex are women and girls. Um, the, uh, a minority are males and they shouldn't be ignored, but you do have to, to understand that there is a highly gendered nature to human trafficking and girls and women tend to be to the most vulnerable here. Um, there are also um, a very small percentage, as you can see in the graphic on the far left, gender minorities. And what they're talking about there is LGBTQIA individuals who are in fact trafficked. And they're very hard to investigate. It's hard to get good data on how many individuals who are in that category, uh, particularly trans individuals who are trafficked. Um, the breakdowns by age, most are adults, but a significant proportion in terms of number of cases. And the, again, these are actually cases that have come to light, have been reported and uh, have been acknowledged by law enforcement, or they are people who have called into the National Human Trafficking Hotline um, and, and stated that they've been trafficked. So just looking at the hotline data, you have the majority calling in are adults uh, but a significant percentage are, are minors, are children. Um, and you have a roughly equal breakdown of people who are foreign um, outside of the United States and people who are local, who are US citizens. Um, of those, those foreign nationals, you know, there's a mixture of countries of origin that show up uh, in among trafficking victims. So to conclude, um, there, there are many, many ways in which people can be sex trafficked, um, and it is a significant global problem, in particular for girls and women, but also for, for men and boys. It's a, a very lucrative industry, and it, it requires a great deal of attention. As a result, um, governments around, around the world are being pressured to pay attention to sex trafficking and other forms of human trafficking um, in order to stop it.
So that concludes my coverage of chapter 18, and it's also my last recorded lecture of the semester.